Good evening and welcome to our annual Martin Luther King Jr. Living Legacy Convocation. Each year, Martin Luther King Jr. Day provides an opportunity to reflect on Dr. King's life and legacy related to promoting racial, social, and economic justice. Dr. King's work is still relevant today. While we have made tremendous gains in promoting justice since he challenged us to make America what it ought to be, we are painfully aware that injustice still remains. In the words of Dr. King, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Reflecting on these words motivate us to conceive of justice as a practice rather than as a state. This practice takes consistent intentional effort and starts with each one of us. This year convocation takes the form of TEDx style talks where faculty and staff, graduate students, undergraduate students, and alumni from across the Yukon system share their engagements with Dr. King's work within our current moment. Today's talks are a reminder that injustice may be deeply personal, but that radical honesty and vulnerabilities enable us to question the systems in our nation and in this institution that continue to perpetuate injustice. Without a doubt, the surest way to ending injustice is to reveal it. I wanna personally thank the brave souls who answered the call to share their stories tonight. I had the chance to preview your reflections and I have to say I was moved by your willingness to speak truth to power. Each of you exemplified Dr. King's belief that our lives begin to end the day we become silent about the things that matter. Thank you for once again choosing to disrupt the silence around those experiences that continue to prevent us from actualizing Dr. King's dream. I have no doubt that your combined counter narratives will serve as a powerful diagnostic catalyst for change as they unleash the emancipatory imagination in all of us who are willing to listen. Your strength, resiliency, and overall commitment to justice reminds us that we at UConn are fortunate to be surrounded by a deeply talented community across all levels and corners of our institution. I invite all of us gathered here this evening to lean in, to open our minds and hearts, and to be grateful for the stories we are about to hear. These role models are doing work that betters our individual and collective humanity, and I'm very grateful for their generosity and overall contributions. It's great to be back at Avery Point again, such a beautiful campus. Dr. King, when I think about Dr. King, a lot of philosophies, ideas, words that, that strike me, but I, I think the one that strikes me most is commitment, his commitment to the betterment of humanity. And I, think, I can't think of anyone who is more committed to Dr. King. And, th and those commitments cost, right? Um, there's a quote of his that I love. We heard President Obama say it often, and that is, the arc of history is long, but it bends towards justice. Now the question for me is, does it bend towards justice based on the weight of truth, or does it bend because we've put our hands to the task? My great-grandmother used to say, I believe in prayer. She was a religious woman. But she also used to say, if you want the mountain to move, you need to put your hands to it. And I think that's the way I grew up. What I know about commitment, how I think about commitment, first um, was brought to me by my grandmother. So I was um, raised by my grandparents in this really small country town in Kansas, one high school, one middle school. Um, from the age of five, kindergarten, I was walking to and from school by myself. It was only seven or eight blocks away and with friends. One day after um, uh, coming out of first grade, I was six years old when King was assassinated in, in 1968. And this was shortly after his assassination. My grandmother was waiting for me when I left the school and she was in a hurry. We almost ran the seven or eight blocks to our house. And when we got there, group of people standing at the back door, we go inside really quickly. She ushers me to my room. I was born in that time when you were a child and you were neither seen or heard. So I can hear there's anxious and nervous talking and they're strategizing about something. And in the midst of this, my grandfather rushes into the house. He's screaming at the top of his lungs that he just lost his job at the post office. I came to understand that evidently my grandmother, who could pass, 
Those are back in the days where if you had white features, you could pass. And my grandma was very light. She had white features. She had gone to the local swimming pool and she had swam. The swimming pool was quasi segregated. Remember, Kansas is the place where Brown versus the Board of Education happened. She got out of the pool after she swam and told the lifeguard, I've just been swimming in your pool and I'm black. She was immediately arrested. She was immediately bailed out by the folks who were at our back door who were part of the Urban League and the NAACP. She rushed to the school to get me just in case somebody else, you know, might have been waiting for me. And I remember when my grandfather was hollering and screaming, my grandmother was entirely calm. She, she, she looked like she was carved out of the side of a mountain. She, her, her, her backbone was like a piece of rod. She was still, she could have cared less. And quite honestly, my grandfather would be fired for a few more jobs based on the work that my grandmother did. But she was absolutely committed to standing up for her own equality, for her own humanity, and she was willing to put herself out for other people. She was deeply committed. Matter of fact, she was one of the strongest black women I have ever known in my entire life. So now it's years later, I barely finished high school. Um, there's no uh, idea about going to college. No one in my family did. I bum around the country. I eventually go in the Navy. I do my 10 years. I come out working at, at Electric Boat here locally and I find my way into the University of Connecticut right here on the Avery Point campus as a student. Years later, after much um, uh, hard work and a lot of people who opened doors for me. I find myself graduated as a playwright, having some work off Broadway and hired back here at the University of Connecticut, right here at Avery Point. I'm a black man, I'm first generation. I'm on a campus that is predominantly white. It was beyond intimidating. It was beyond the imposter syndrome. It would have been so easy for me to just sit in the corner and, and to be quiet. First person I told I got the job was my grandmother. And she sent me this, this wonderful plaque and on the plaque it read professor. And I proudly sat it on my desk. And one day a colleague came in my office and said, you're not a professor, are you? Now I'm, I'm absolutely sure that that colleague meant the term in the, in the strictest of definitions, right? Assistant, associate, professor. But I was immediately struck by that. I immediately felt this, this idea of less than creep in on me, but I knew where that plaque came from. And I thought about my grandmother and I thought about her standing in that living room, resolute, committed. And I thought to myself, that's what I need to be. I need to be committed. I need to be committed and put myself in for each position that I think that I'm qualified for. I need to be committed and move into leadership when I think I'm qualified to do that. I need to be committed to stand on the, on the progress or the failure or the success based on the quality of my work. And, and demand that others see me in that same way. And I think it's always easier to do that when you bring yourself to that space and you use your voice to support others who are feeling that same way. I can imagine right now my grandfather, as he often has, is looking at me and shaking his head. But I hope, I truly hope that my grandmother is smiling. Ayanchu, Ayanmi. Ayin Punchai, Nyoka Sweetie Sandy Grande, Nyoka Quechuacani, Hartford, Connecticut, Montecani. I introduce myself in my language, which is Quechua. I identify as a Quechua national, which is important to me, not just as an identity in the individual sense that we often think about that, but it instructs me about who I am and how to be in the world, what it means to be a Quechua person. As citizens of sovereign nations, indigenous peoples have a really complicated relationship to the nation state. What does it even mean to struggle for freedom on stolen land? Can democracy even be built on the death of thousands? Dr. King famously, in one of his speeches, Why We Can't Wait, started with the words, our nation was built and born on genocide. So he understood the conditions of indigenous peoples. And indigenous peoples supported him Lots of delegates from different Native nations were there with him for the March on Washington. And they worked alongside him and other peoples all throughout the Civil Rights Movement. Um, that's also where the American Indian Movement was born. While all those events were before my time, I learned about this history and those events through my parents, both of which were really strong advocates for justice, especially my mom, I think. They really believed like Dr. King, that this country could live up to, could live up to its promise and its possibility. 
and that it was our imperative to really make sure that that happened. My mom, in addition to struggling and advocating for justice, a part of that for her was always telling it like it is, telling the hard truths. And Dr. King, too, clearly was an advocate. He didn't believe in nationalist myths. He really fought against the suppression of truth. So I think they'd bo both be appalled to see what's going on today, especially the legislation impacting schools, teachers and students being told how they can and cannot talk about history. They would definitely be appalled about the persistent inequities, especially around health, the ways in which those health inequities have been brought forward by the pandemic. For most of her working life, my mom worked right over here in St. Francis Hospital. And I think a lot about how she'd be managing in these times. But I know she'd be managing. I know she'd be strong. And more than anything, I know she'd be on the front lines. She believed in service. As Quechua peoples were peoples of community, of mutual aid, and of service. She would always say, you have to pray with your feet. Dr. King, as a you know, he was also a reverend, he was a preacher, and that was something that really resonated for my family. But he didn't just preach, you know, about his God to his congregants. He was a preacher for the people, a preacher of the people. And a big part of his message was about teaching those hard truths, not a blind faith. In one of his last speeches, one of his last books, actually, he really named things like capitalism, things like imperialism and colonialism as part of the evils behind racism and white supremacy. I think if he spoke those words today, he'd be derided and dismissed, maybe even called a socialist. But he would always say he wasn't, he, while he taught us about the limits of capitalism, he wasn't a socialist. He said he lost his faith in economic systems. His faith was really in the people. So I think if we're gonna honor his legacy, honor his words. We all need to be advocates for truth and for hard truths. We need to pray with our feet. Supaiki, anye, anye. Good morning, everyone. We're going to begin with a quote from Martin Luther King's Christmas sermon of 1967. For the judgment of God is upon us. And we can either stand together as brothers, or we can all perish as fools. Keep in mind, the fools will be part of a few speeches today. So when I heard this quote, I couldn't help but ask myself, when was Dr. King actually writing this? Because when I read it, I hear a lot of remarks that remind me of today, particularly when he says the judgment of God is upon us, not to force any particular religion on anyone, but we're in a weird circumstance right now. And Dr. King had just come back from India when he had spoke about this. He described what it was like observing homeless folks, hunger and depravity in the streets, oftentimes outside of city buildings that were flourishing, having this dissonance of circumstances in close proximity. He talked about experiencing depression, which is something that occurs when you become hyper aware of global issues that you can't have any type of change over. He talked about the value of interdependence within community. And all those would be important lessons for us to deal with while grappling with a pandemic. But I specifically want to hone in on that last part about interdependence. So I fancy myself as a doctoral candidate, as a graduate instructor, as someone who wears many hats and juggles many roles. But I learned this from various folks when I was an undergrad. I was a TRIO student. Shout outs to McNair Scholars Program. I see y'all. For all those who have been through a program like this or have been brought into a living learning service organization, you may have seen that the same person who's writing your emails for acceptance is also pot potentially grading your papers or giving you advice on how to give that presentation. And that's something that many folks are going to experience in their careers. This was something that Dr. King experienced as well. You see, the quote that he offered, it sounds very much like him, but I can't help but wonder who influenced him to get to the point where he's speaking on interdependence. You see, I've had the pleasure the last several years of beginning the calendar year, not the academic year in September, but beginning the new calendar year in January, teaching race, class, and gender for the University of Connecticut. We're heading into Black History Month every year, the last week of January, the first week of February, which means it's around the same time to bring up all the figures that make the sum of parts 
that you may not hear as much about. And this speech is about Dr. King. However, I also have to call attention to folks like Ella Baker, to Bayard Rustin. These were individuals that I was introduced to in my African American Studies courses that have now become the backbone and the introduction to the syllabi for courses that I now teach to many students like yourself. The funny thing about these individuals is they offer so many great qualities and lessons to learn from, but for various reasons that you can learn about yourself, they would be considered outsiders, outcasts, despite being the organizers of all these great movements. For students today, we've been bound to our structures for so many months and we're probably wondering, how do I contribute to something moving forward if I can't go out and protest with a picket sign, if I'm worried about conducting some type of illness? I would wonder what Dr. King would have to say in modern times about the interdependence of community and the various roles folks can take on to push to make change. So in modern times, as you're being asked to serve on that committee, to speak on that particular issue, like myself, I have to ask what colleges and institutions are giving back to students. As I've written more letters of recommendation for folks to join me in graduate school that I would ever like to do in my short time, I've seen that folks want to be a part of this process. But I've also had to read various emails from students saying, sorry I showed up to class late today. I was coming from a late work shift. Or I'm going to try my best to have my assignment in on time at the end of the week. My grandma just passed away from COVID. And I can't help but wonder all the different roles that my undergraduate students are servicing while also coming to class each day on Zoom and trying to stay focused and get their A. So as a collective community, I ask us to come together and think, what are we doing, not just in our interpersonal relationships, but on a structural level to be interdependent? Because we can give all these accolades to the charismatic leaders who push forward and create these great quotes for us to cite. But I would argue that Dr. King was challenged in many ways by Rustin and Baker, and it evolved his stances on various issues, much like that of other figures. So I can't tell you what MLK would say or how it would feel, but I would just wonder that if he were here in this current generation, what would be his take on things? And how would he promote us to move forward using technology and new ways of communication to make sure that no one's forgotten in this dialogue and that we all rest upon each other to pick up the areas that we struggle in? Thank you. Have a happy Martin Luther King Day. When I think of Dr. Martin Luther King, I think of several things he represented. He envisioned an America embraced by the world for its diversity, its equity in the treatment of others, and its solidarity. Certainly, we've made strides in this regard in society today. His legacy was based on altruism, courage, and fearlessness without foolishness. These are certainly tall boots to fill, but one that's held by many individuals in society today. All of us, through our varied experiences, have had moments of naivety, drive and self-determination, and sometimes being weary-eyed. But ultimately, we do have an obligation before we leave this planet to act in a humane and responsible way. So how do I view myself in light of all of these things and how do I view my responsibilities? Well, I'm not only a mother, daughter, wife, sister, but I'm also an individual who can connect with other individuals on multiple levels. I'm also a physician, a physician who's aptly in a position to inspire aspire and advocate for change. This is a role in which I continue to grow even though I've been doing this for over 10 years. But the experiences and each day is never the same. Each day is fitted with its own challenges and also with its own rewards. In healthcare, we continue to deal with inequity, problems with access, biases, and skewed priorities. And then, as an emergency physician, there's also limited time and limited resources to have a meaningful impact, an immediate impact, on a person's social circumstance. 
Nevertheless, I am very grateful to have chosen this path. And I'm very grateful to all the teachers and mentors that I've had and make it a point to be a teacher and mentor to others. I am thankful for, and when I reflect on leaders, such as Dr. Martin Luther King, I think of some of the things he would really advocate for today. And that includes us being motivated, staying motivated, persevere, and avoid trivial pursuits. Additionally, I think he would also warn us against distractions that ultimately have an underlying goal to deny us the unification that's so desperately needed today. I think that all of what Dr. Martin Luther King stood for is very much applicable today. We all need to examine our values, but not just in the context of an occupancy of one. We're all citizens of the earth, whether we like it or not. And this is not to say that we should not do what's right, not do what's just, or what's important to us, but we should act with intention that has a positive meaning, not just to ourselves, but to others. We are influenced by and continue to be influenced by others. As physicians, we are part of a group of individuals who are held to a certain standard. And as such, we are at the helm of being exemplars in this role. I do believe that wisdom does come with age and experience, but we also need to think very soberly about things. Diversity should not be viewed in a negative light. Also, differences in opinion shouldn't always be viewed in terms of rightness and wrongness. And although we do have the right to make our own decisions based on our beliefs and our convictions, we do need to take ownership of the fact that sometimes these decisions can negatively impact someone else. We're constantly striving for happiness but I would encourage, and I think all the leaders, all our past leaders, including Dr. Martin Luther King, would encourage us to look for something that's more rewarding and long-lasting, such as joy. We are all authors of our own documentary, but we should understand that everyone will be viewing the footage. Hola, ¿qué tal? Mi nombre es Oscar Guerra y tengo un sueño también. My name is Oscar Guerra and I have a dream. It was perhaps 20 years ago when I first, Dr. King's speech, I have a dream. I was a 10 year old boy in Mexico, in my hometown, in Guadalajara, Jalisco. And I remember the day like it was yesterday. I was there with my twin sister and we were having uh, uh, movie time. And for some reason, the, the, the teacher decided that uh, we were going to watch uh, this motivational speech. And I know that a lot of people were talking, you know, it's like it's a black and white, we want to watch some, something else. As soon as Dr. King started the speech, everyone went quiet. And we were listening. We were listening and we were really paying attention to what he was saying. And I don't think that many of us completely understood what he was saying because it was in English, you know, and it was not, it didn't have subtitles. We were just uh, 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 watching it. And there was something so powerful about that, that speech that transcended language, transcended time. It transcended uh, barriers, cultural barriers. Uh, even age generation. You're talking about a, a group of with 10 year olds. And the tone of his speech and the way in which he was talking with so much passion started inspiring the group in there. And I think that's, that was one of the key moments when I decided to become a storyteller. And I realized the power of media. 
media has the power to convey those positive and important messages. I think that um, part of uh, what made me follow my own dream was that the, to be able to be the producer of your own story, of your own narrative. I moved to the States 10 years ago to pursue a PhD. And it was in the School of Journalism in the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. And Dr. Dr. King's speech was, has always been in the back of my mind trying to, to, to understand what the dream is. I think that as immigrants, we come here following the dream, but really, what is the American dream? What is the American dream for you? I think that it has changed, and we may have different uh, ideas. Uh, I think that the, the idea of freedom, and that was one of the words that he kept repeating on that speech over and over again, freedom. And how do you understand freedom? And how do you understand that, that dream? Um, we have a beautiful saying from Octavio Paz in Spanish, which is uh, merece tus sueños, deserve your dreams. So I think that it's almost a call for action. You know, it's a call for action to say uh, what you are and what you can do. I noticed that there was a lack of representation for my Latino community here in the States. And I would watch the news. Uh, and at that time, I was just watching pretty much everything, CNN, Fox News, BBC, Reuters. And I was trying to understand what, 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 was, what was being told about this freedom and this freedom of speech and this diversity and the U.S. being the beacon of light. And I started living it by myself. I started noticing, and I started noticing that the power of media can really help you shape that idea. I decided to become uh, a filmmaker and a storyteller to tell the story of the Latino people. And I was very inspired by Dr. King's speech and mainly with civil rights movements. I think that we need more figures like him nowadays. I think that, uh, that, that media is a double-edged sword that can definitely help to create or destroy. I think that uh, being a professor and being an educator has been one of my biggest passions because I'm able to share with my students and the future generation that you can tell your own story and you can follow your dream y que podemos seguir nuestro sueño juntos. My story, my life, all comes and centers around the really beautiful and complex community that I've come from. Uh, I come from a neighborhood where 
people didn't always make the best choices. Wiley didn't always make the best choices. And I think in those instances, we learn a lot about ourselves and our people. And oftentimes, we figure out that some of those folks were told to do something, but they weren't equipped with the tools to do it, to make the change. And that always reminds me of Dr. Martin Luther King's legacy and the ideals that he's instilled in our society that we still work to unleash and unveil today. The quote that I think about when I imagine these kinds of stories is the one about bootstraps. Dr. King says, and I say in quotes, not gonna be exact, but it's all right to tell a man to pull himself up, a man or a woman to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. But it's a cruel jest to tell a bootless person, a bootless man, to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. When I was growing up, I thought that I was a bootless person because of the environment that I was raised in, the resources, the tools that I was given that were put in front of me, that were taken from us to do and live a life that was pursuing some kind of happiness. Right, And my peers didn't always make the best choices. It um, often left them down one or two pathways, um, you know, the penitentiary, the cemetery, however you want to look at it. And by no means am I saying that I make the best choices, that I have made the best choices. I have made some major mistakes, right? But. I managed to, at a young age, make a, a really key decision, an important decision that changed my life forever. I chose education. I chose to be a scholar. This is coming from a kid who my mom and my sisters will laugh, but I hated school. I hated it, every part of it, going to it, being there, the whole process. Up until around my junior year of high school, 2006, 2007, and I made a decision that I, or I come to some realization that I could actually make it in college. I, I could probably succeed. And the fact that I wanted to probably have a little bit of fun too, because all my friends were going on college tours and whatnot, and I was just sitting around chilling. So that first marking period, I figured out, all right, cool, let's, let's Buckle down, I'm paying attention in class, and I got straight A's. I was a C and D person through and through, right? That was me. I did just enough not to have to go to summer school. Um, but then when I got to this school, I had to actually push myself. And when I did, I succeeded. But I didn't fully commit, and I missed in one key area punctuality, right? The school I went to, every tardy was an absence, and a tardy was your one minute over 8 o'clock. So if you got to school at 8.01, you were tardy slash late equals absent. You only got six opportunities to do that. I got eight. So at the end of the marking period, when I thought I had all these straight A's, I'm getting all these great quizzes, all well, my grades were rendered Fs. And as you can imagine, the devastation, the depression that sets on someone who really pushes themselves to do something that they didn't think that they were good at doing, set in. And I wanted to quit. I wanted to give up. I don't know what switched in my head. I don't know if it was the, the intensity or whatever of the moment but I pushed and I persevered and I humbled myself to push towards something greater. And I didn't give up and I succeeded that year and senior year and I ended up, as you can tell, I went off to college and I'm doing different things in my life. My life's trajectory had changed. And not at the time, in hindsight, I learned something key about myself, 
and the process of making change in your life. Failure is absolutely essential to living. Failure taught me that as I push and progress, that I have to stay perseverant and cannot quit. And that's how I'll pull myself up. Education was a tool that I used, a vehicle that I rode to take me to different places. But I had to stay vigilant to the fight. And so to the bootless person, to the person that's in a class right now, about to quit, you're gonna fail, you haven't done what you had to do all semester, don't quit. Keep pushing. Because your success, your triumph, may be right there. There is always a light at the end of the tunnel. And from this kid from Bridgeport, Connecticut, who hated school, who could have easily been a statistic on a marker in somebody's police department or on somebody's death certificate, that I could do it, and so can you. So if you're bootless, don't kill it. Pull yourself up, identify those tools, be humble, lean on people, lean on systems in your village, and don't quit. If only I knew the power of words. Mind you, I own a bookstore and I love to read, but if only I knew I could literally define the world around me with my words. Einstein coined E equals MC squared. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. formulated words plus dreams equal delta change. Like Dr. King's passion pivot for social justice, I'm an engineer turned book slanger. At the age of 12, I fell in love with what I defined as my dream school, UCOD. Being a young student 3,000 miles away, I took every opportunity to proclaim my future as a Yukon Husky. I literally envisioned myself taking classes, being on campus, and even participating in the marching band. I used that passion to fuel a new reality. May 10th, 2010, I materialized this new reality I dreamed of. Sue me for plagiarizing a book written by the Lord, but it goes, death and life are in the power of the tongue. The word Martin, who comes to mind? Trayvon Martin, Luther King Jr., created a defining point in my life. His verdict was so stacked with injustice, it sparked my journey to find answers. I asked and I received. Key Bookstore was created after I read a book that totally changed the course of my life. I wanted to become another vehicle for people to discover these books. If you want to hide something, hide it in a book. Dreams may be just as contagious as the Omarion variant. So I'm going to take off my mask and literally infect you all with my dream. I dream of living in a world in harmony with the most advanced technologies of the metaverse, NFTs, and apps engaging in curations of a history untold, but so telling. Now, I'm a fire sign, 
and I'm fueled by fire. It was fire the state of Maine threatened my ancestors in 1912 to remove themselves from Malaga Island because they were a mixed race community. This was 17 years before the birth of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. It was 17 bodies on Malaga Island that were exhumed and relocated on land. One being Laura Tripp, my great great grandmother, who died on a small boat after not being allowed to dock for months because they were black. In 2017, I was able to walk across the stage as a Yukon graduate of my dream school because of the Malaga Island Scholarship. And today, January 17th, 2022, we acknowledge Dr. Martin Luther King's infectious legacy for justice in a virtual event during a pandemic. Jay-Z has a, a lyric in Kanye West's song, Swagger Like Us, where he goes, you could pay for books, but you can't buy class. And when I take this opportunity, this moment, to reflect on Dr. King's legacy and everything that he strived for, everything that he wanted to see in society, and the work that still needs to be done, that rap lyric resonates in my head. You could pay for books, but you can't buy class. It resonates within me because as a first generation student, I could relate. It resonates within me because as a first generation professional, I too can also relate. As a first generation student, I recall applying for colleges, the anxiety I was filled with because I was the first in my family to go to college. My parents didn't finish, they barely started. And now it was all on me to be successful and to pave the way for my brother and sister behind me. I recall after being accepted into my college, I recall meeting with the financial aid advisor, me and a group of friends. And when we were going over our financial aid packages, for whatever reason, we had it in our minds that we were just gonna go without accepting any loans. We were just gonna make it through the next four years or so. But then she slid that paperwork back and she said, where are you gonna come up with $18,000 to finance your education? Do your parents have that amount right now sitting in their accounts? And the answer was no. So all four of us, we checked off all the boxes, slid the paperwork back, and she promised us one day after you graduate, you'll be able to pay back these loans. But for now, you need to take on these loans in order to finance your education to get to the dream. Education is one area where black Americans are hurting the most due to institutionalized racism especially when it comes to student loans. Black Americans take on 85% more education debt in comparison to their white counterparts. And that figure gets compounded when it comes to the interest rates after a student graduates. As the drumbeat grows steadier to cancel student loan debt, I have an idea of the students that rely on financial aid and the ones that do not. I can see who would benefit from having their student loan debt canceled and who would not. As a first generation professional, more often than not, I'm in a space where I'm the only person that looks like me. When it comes to finding a supervisor or an individual that I can look up to as a mentor, that looks like me, that can relate to me, I'm hard pressed to find that person. I'm hard pressed to find an individual that can pour into my professional development, my professional growth. And on the flip side, when it comes to being a first generation professional, having been a first generation alum, there are some times where I have conversations with my own father and he discusses or he'll ask, Tone, you have 
your job now? What's your salary like? What are you making? You made it. You're on the highway that we talked about when you were little. I got you to the highway. Now you're taking off. How, how, how are you doing for yourself? And then when I share with him how much my salary is, he goes, you mean to tell me we sent you to school to get one degree, you came out with two of them. And despite that, despite your experience, despite how smart you are, you're making or you're bringing home the same amount that I do as an uneducated cab driver. Those words tend to stick with me. And I keep thinking about Jay-Z's rap lyric where he goes, you could pay for books, but you can't buy class. And then when we bring it back full circle and reflect on Dr. King's legacy, and again, everything that he strived for, all the changes that he wanted to see in society, as well as what has still, what is still lingering 40, 50 years after his death. It just goes to show you that there's still work to be done. You can pay for books, but you can't buy class. Dr. Martin Luther King's legacy encompasses influential decisions, monumental actions, and steady fast progress for all of America. He had a vision to make sure that we became diverse, equalized, and was the, had the ability to do whatever we wanted to do. When I first learned about Dr. Martin Luther King in history class, we all, as always, started out with the I had a, I had a dream speech. But my professor left me with many quotes from Dr. Martin Luther King. And one of my favorite quotes was, life's most persistent and urgent question is what are you doing for others? This left me with trying to figure out what my own vision is. What do I want to do? And so I decided that I want to also give back to others and become a part of the community. I personally want to do a career in the insurance industry where I act out and help promote economic growth. What I want to do with that is help the community, make healthcare equality um, available for everyone, no matter what your race is, no matter what your gender is. I want you to be able to walk out and feel free when it comes to healthcare. And the reason where that started is because when I was growing up, I had a pacemaker. So I wasn't allowed to go out and play sports. Sometimes I had to spend long hours in the hospital, so I wasn't always at school. So this is where my value of education came in, my value of community service, giving back. Because once I was finally free and I no longer had my complication, I wanted to just go out into the world and help everyone. Now with this newfound freedom, I wanted to make sure everything was equal. People were no longer scared of this world, word called healthcare. And so with my goal, I know in my vision, I need to go out and talk. I need to start having conversations with people, but leaving a positive image. So having conversations and getting to know people is what helps me become what I like to call a visionary leader, someone who goes out and helps make the world a better place, stands in the places that you would normally not see people. Especially as a woman of color, I want to be in the space everyone else is afraid to walk through. If there's a door and there's people afraid to walk through it, I want to walk through it first. Just so you can see that the leader that I am, I want everyone to feel ready and comfortable to come in whenever they need to. I do this through many of my involvement on campus. When I was in high school, I did well over 200 hours of community service. I did this going to the YMCA, going to homeless shelters. So when I got to college, it was only right to continue my duty of service. So now you can find me involved with Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated, as well as Praise Dance Team, being a mentor for various cultural centers, and then I also had the ability to be an FYE mentor in my last semester. The reason why I love, again, to be a part of these organizations and involvement is because I'm getting firsthand experience with different stu students. Especially being a first generation student myself, when I was able to finally be a teacher, I was able to put them in experiences that they never heard of before. I gave them resources, I directed them to different people. I wanted to make sure that they were feeling that their presence made a difference. And that is how I like to bring in that influential decisions part into my life. For me, 
My involvement is a understanding of who I am. My pacemaker is an understanding of who I am. And without having these two things come into my life, I wouldn't understand what my purpose in life is anymore. But over time, I did get to understand what Dr. King meant in his I Had a Dream speech and his understanding of what are you doing for others. And so Dr. King's generation did their part. Now it's time for us to do ours. Good evening, everyone. I'm Carl Lejway, the provost and a professor in the Department of Psychological Sciences here at UConn. I'm honored to provide closing remarks for this amazing event led by our talented and dedicated leadership and staff in the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. Their work is every day, but it's moments like this where we truly get to see all they do and what their contributions mean for UConn. We are here tonight to celebrate the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King. Dr. King stands out for his vision and commitment to a collective and intentional mission of creating a world that embraces diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. As we saw tonight, Dr. King's commitment continues with us. Everyone has a role to play and a story to tell. And we were treated to some remarkable stories tonight. I want to take a minute and recognize each of our speakers. Amaya Cordova, one of our amazing undergraduates who's double major in STEM and an individual major in healthcare, is truly crucial at a time when this combination of skills couldn't be more valuable. Assistant Director Wiley Dawson who represents UConn Hartford and is instrumental in helping students bridge their intellectual development at UConn into marketable career opportunities and social mobility. Professor Sandy Grande, who leverages disciplinary expertise in philosophy and American studies, as well as women, gender, and sexuality studies in an interdisciplinary approach that gives voice to indigenous communities on a local, national, and international stage. Professor Oscar Guerra, an Emmy award-winning director whose work dares each of us to interrogate our assumptions and stereotypes as part of a personal and societal evolution towards mutual respect and inclusivity. Reese Hall, a graduate student who's done enormous work supporting our anti-black racism course and doing so while pursuing his own PhD studies and scholarship in the field of black masculinity. Kamani Harrison, a graduate of UConn who's shown immense commitment to making the world a better place with her interest in environmental engineering, and who also happens to be one of the most notable early career entrepreneurs in the US. Professor Kalila Hunter Anderson, faculty at UConn Health who completed a residency in UConn and is now making significant contributions in emergency medicine as both a clinician and an educator. Tony Omega, a UConn grad now representing Waterbury students as an academic advisor where he specializes in working with students in a holistic and empowering approach. And Professor Michael Bradford, a brilliant playwright who I can proudly call my partner as he leads our efforts in the provost office to support the development of our faculty, staff, and students with a particular effort to support those who are marginalized by a multitude of threats at the structural and individual level in society and at UConn. These individuals have told their story tonight with radical honesty and vulnerability that inspires each of us to do the same. Moreover, it motivates and empowers us to strive to become willing to call out and act to correct injustice. We do so because these efforts humanize those impacted and helps us evolve as an inclusive and just community. As Dr. King explains, the arc of history is long and it bends towards justice, but it only bends towards justice if we conceptualize justice as a practice each day in the ways each of us can uniquely contribute to it. As we learn tonight, telling our stories is part of the practice of justice. Disseminating your story can provide a model for others in their practice. Let's all keep this in mind every day as we work together to make UConn a national leader 
in diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. Thank you for being here tonight. And it is really, again, um, our honor to be putting on this event.